Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, with great pleasure, uh, let me invite you all to the commencement lecture of the Jindal Global Law School, uh, Personal Perspectives on Navigating Cross-Border Legal Practice by Mr. Nandan Nelevicki, partner of White & Case. It's truly a great moment for us. We have uh, a distinguished guest, Mr. Nandan Nelevicki, partner of White & Case New York, as our commencement speaker. We have with us Professor C. Rajkumar, our Honorable Vice Chancellor and Dean of Jindal Global Law School, our dearest students of the batch of 2020 and their parents, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, our registrar, Professor Vishwas Devaya, Vice Dean and Director of Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, and Professor Anand Mishra, Director of Law Admissions. And I'm Professor Srijit SG, Executive Dean of Jindal Global Law School. I welcome you all to the commencement lecture on the theme, Personal Perspectives on Navigating Cross-Border Legal Practice. Globalization has moved us into a newer existence. Of everything associated with globalization, the most noteworthy is change. Of the many changes that globalization has caused, the most noteworthy is the annihilation of space by time. That means globalization is a new sense of time and space. We do not anymore have the sense of two-dimensional Euclidean spaces. Today, we live in metageographies, which give us the experience of multiple times, putting us in a transpatial existence. The transpatial existence has us reorganizing our lives on a large scale, evidenced by cross-border imaginations, cross-border movements, and cross-border transactions. Many such changes have been evident since last three decades. The trans spaces have also led to the loss of the sense of borders. Gone are the days when national, regional, or local borders bound us to a given geography. Today, we live with a global identity, a plural identity of being a global citizen. Mr. Nandan Nelviji will tell you in great detail in the richness of his experience as a cross-border dealmaker, how to navigate cross-border legal practice. Once more, I welcome you all to the commencement lecture and to Jindal Global Law School. I now invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor C. Rajkumar, and the Dean of Jindal Global Law School to uh, introduce Jindal Global Law School and the commencement lecture. Thank you very much, um, Srijit. It's indeed a very special day for us um, as we welcome the students who have joined the LLM program at the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies. Jindal Global Law School, OP Jindal Global University. Uh, it's also a very special day for us as we begin the new academic session at Jindal Global Law School. And we couldn't have had a better person uh, to join us uh, to deliver the commencement lecture on the theme, Personal Perspectives on Navigating Cross-Border Legal Practice. Mr. Nandan Nelivigi, a partner at White & Case, New York. Before I formally introduce uh, uh, Nandan to our distinguished uh, guests here, but also the parents and students of uh, who have joined the Jindal Global Law School's LLM program. Let me take a moment to reflect on the state of affairs as we begin the new academic session. For all the students who have joined the Jindal Global Law School's LLM program, I can only fathom your anxiety and your concerns as you begin this new academic session at a university and law school that you have not yet visited. You belong to that generation, probably a in a century when you are actually entering into the portals of an institution on the first day of your academic journey without visiting that institution and actually doing this online. Of course, you have already shown a deep sense of resilience. The fact that the work and indeed your study should go uninterrupted despite the global pandemic. As Vice Chancellor of OP Jindal Global University, let me assure you that we will leave no stone unturned to make your experience truly special, to be able to provide you with transformative legal education that can empower you with the knowledge and skills and perspectives that will help you to achieve your goals and aspirations. Our effort at Jindal Global Law School is to provide you with world-class legal education. The faculty, the courses, the curriculum, the programs, the research agenda, the pedagogy, the methodology, the collaborations, the partnerships, the conferences, the lectures, the workshops, the seminars, everything that we have gathered together 
for advancing this cause of institution building as a part of the LLM program is with a view to pursue the goal of achieving excellence. I sincerely hope that as soon as it is possible, you will be able to visit the campus, move into the campus and make it as your own home. With those words, let me have the pleasure and privilege of formally welcoming my dear friend and indeed mentor, Mr. Nandan Nelivigi. Nandan Nelivigi, as Chambers Global says, is described by clients as calm, clear-headed, and extremely articulate, unquote. They add that, and I quote, his ability to get on top of the job, organize multi-jurisdictional resources, and handle crisis situations is very high, and his advice and guidance to clients is clear and prompt, unquote, Chambers Global. Nandan heads the Whiten Cases Energy and Infrastructure Practices for the Americas. Nandan also heads Whiten Cases India team. Nandan leads teams on complex transactions and provides strategic advice spanning multiple jurisdictions and specialization. Nandan is a graduate of the first batch of the National Law School of India, University Bengaluru, and also a graduate of the LLM program at the Harvard Law School. Nandan is also and we are very delighted that he serves as a member of the International Board of Advisors for Jindal Global Law School. He's also on the board of the Friends of Teach for India and was formerly an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School. Behind all, beyond all these things I just said, Nandan is also a deeply passionate individual when it comes to legal education and indeed reforms in legal profession. He has also been a champion for building partnerships and collaborations for Indian institutions, including Jindal, with his own firm, but also beyond that. He has been a great friend of our university and law school for many years. I have been very privileged to have discussed this idea of building this university, creating this law school long before I even moved to India. It was a very, at a very early stage of the very idea that Nandan not only believed in it, trusted in it and galvanized intellectual consciousness among many of his friends that laid the foundations of the institution building effort that we undertook. We owe a debt of intellectual gratitude to Nandan Nalivigi for his early support to the idea of OP Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School. We couldn't have had a better commencement speaker to begin the new academic session of the LLM program at Jindal Global Law School. With those words, I invite Mr. Nandan Nalivigi, partner, White in Case, New York, to deliver his commencement lecture on the theme, personal perspectives on navigating cross-border legal practice. Over to you, Nandan. Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you, Srijit, um, and all other uh, <clears throat> members of the Jindal community who have assembled here. Um, and it's great to be addressing um, the class, LLM class at uh, Jindal Global Law School that's starting off today and their parents. Uh, welcome and I appreciate your time. I'm already energized by just simply hearing the inspirational words coming out of Raj and Srijit. It's such an inspiring community um, and institution that you all are part of. I wished I could be there in person. Um, this is a moment to reflect upon all the good things that this world has to offer. And sometimes um, <clears throat> we, you know, you know, one way to look at the positives of the situation we are in is that we're much more appreciative of what we all have with all the difficulties that we have in, um, in the world we live in. Uh, it has become much harder now and I hope we can get back to our normal life very soon with a new perspective and new appreciation for all the <clears throat> benefits, privileges that we all have. And with a new appreciation for all the struggles and difficulties a lot of other people in the world face and encounter. You know, we as lawyers and aspiring lawyers, students, academics, faculty members are a privileged group especially privileged when we think about practicing law across the world, across borders, without being constrained by 
uh, multiple obstacles that most of the people in this world face. Um, it's something to celebrate. It's something that we can use for our own benefit as well as for the benefit of those people who are in most need of that help. And <clears throat> I mention these things only because, you know, what matters most in as we navigate um, through these big words in a cross-border legal practice, multi-jurisdictional practice, multi-specialization practice, what matters is the perspective. To me, uh, <clears throat> having that perspective about where we are, what is the context, what we are really doing, who is benefiting, who is hurting, um, where we come from, where we are going, that is really what we all have to remind ourselves um, as we get through our careers every step of the way. We can't forget that big picture. You know, we're all uh, products of our own experiences, our own struggles, our own successes. And, you know, we have come through various struggles and those shape us as individuals, regardless of the context, regardless of which law school you're in, regardless of which law firm you're in, regardless of um, the high positions that we all occupy. Um, so, you know, if you don't take away anything else at the end of this uh, speech, the one thing I would like you all to take away is just keeping that perspective in mind. And as you kind of pursue your dreams, think about what kind of perspective you are going to cultivate, you are going to develop along the way. Um, th there are certain qualities that you pick up from people you come across even at law school, people you come across in the profession, people like me who kind of make this appearance from time to time. You know, there are various basic fundamental qualities that you focus on, you like or dislike. You know, just rattle out some of those things. It's the quality of perseverance, determination, resilience, humbleness, modesty, confidence. You know, just keep all of those in mind as you uh, embark upon this path. So in order to illustrate some of those points, instead of looking like somebody who just rattles off these big words and um, <clears throat> uh, noble ideas, I'm going to just walk you through some of the anecdotes that have shaped me or experiences that have shaped me and influenced my thinking. Not all of them, but a few of those that uh, <clears throat> stand out in my own memory. I'll start with an experience of an obstacle. I, <clears throat> I was all of uh, 23 years old when I graduated from Harvard Law School from the LLM class and started a job at White & Case. I did not take the bar exam when I started off uh, at White & Case in 1994. I had an internship in the summer in uh, California working on environmental matters. I didn't have the time to do my bar exam. I spent a year at uh, White & Case being an international lawyer. I was supposed to be there for one year and return back to India. I was looking forward to being part of new emerging India that was globalized, integrated. We had no idea what it meant to be globalized. I had grown up in a country that was insulated from the global economy at that point of time. All I wanted to do was learn some basic skills that would help me as India continued to integrate into the global economy. Fast forward one year, I had completed one year at White & Case and I was going to take my bar exam. I had received my confirmation about the date uh, when I was supposed to take the bar exam. I had taken eight weeks off from work in order to prepare for the bar exam. It's a pretty rigorous preparation for the New York bar exam. Two days before the bar exam, I received a notice from the board of bar examiners saying, I'm actually not eligible to take the bar exam. And the reason was New York requires minimum of 24 credits in order to take the bar exam. You have only taken 18 credits from Harvard Law School and therefore 
you are not eligible to take the bar exam. This is two days before after having put in efforts for eight, almost eight weeks in preparation, nonstop, not having seen anybody else. I had been locked up in my apartment preparing for the bar exam. I immediately ran to um, the two neighbors in my office who were sitting next to me, Owen Pell, seasoned litigator who was a partner, and Stephen Wood, a Canadian lawyer. They immediately dropped everything they were doing, prepared uh, a petition to the Court of Appeals. They looked up the rules. The rule said that the Board of Bar Examiners should waive the requirement for 24 credits if somebody is a graduate from a jurisdiction which provides substantively equivalent legal education as that provided in New York. And it was assumed that most common law jurisdictions around the world provided substantively equivalent uh, educational education as New York at that point of time. But I was the graduate of the first batch of students from National Law School. Nobody had heard about National Law School at that point of time. They didn't know what kind of education National Law School uh, provided. So Owen and Stepan prepared this petition. And they asked me what courses I had taken at Harvard Law School, what courses I had taken at National Law School. I put together the list of courses I had taken. And one of them happened to be a constitutional law course with a renowned constitutional uh, authority in the US, Lawrence Tribe. I had done my thesis with Abe Chase, who was advisor to the Kennedy government in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, they had written letters of recommendation. But most importantly, I showed them a five years of legal courses that I had taken at National Law School. And there was no question that my legal education was substantively equivalent to what New York law schools offered. And they drafted a petition filed the petition by fax. At that point of time, there were no emails. And called the court clerk, managed to get this on the docket of the judge. And the next day, we had an order from the Court of Appeals directing the Board of Bar Examiners to waive the requirement and allowed me to appear for the bar exam. It still brings me joy how Owen and Stepan set aside everything they had and helped me get through that obstacle. What that illustrates is really, you know, the kind of challenges that you face in this cross-border practice, the kind of help you get, you basically take whatever you help you can get and make the best you can out of the help you get. You find the mentors, you push through the obstacles. You maintain that positivity. You maintain perseverance. Maintain the eye on the, the ball and push forward, basically. What it also illustrates is how fragmented this legal practice is. Every state in the United States has its own bar uh, admission requirements. They have tried to provide for some reciprocity, but it's still not the same. And every country has its own restrictions for lawyers to practice. But this, in this globalized world, clients do not care about those artificial distinctions. What they want is integrated advice. They, what they want are solutions in this globalized world. And <clears throat> we have some antiquated bar rules protectionist rules that protect each bar's right to practice law in their jurisdictions. And it's a thin line between providing clients the advice they need and the solutions they need and illegal practice of or unauthorized practice of law. And so in this world, how do you navigate those kinds of restrictions? And I'll come to that in greater de detail towards the end of it. But let me end of my presentation 
Let me give you a few other anecdotes that will help build up the story. So once I started at White and Case, one of the opportunities I had was to work on one of the largest transactions that was going on in India at that point of time. And this was the construction and financing of one of the largest power projects in the country at that point of time, now infamous double power project, project in Maharashtra, which was built at an expense of $3 billion by three American owners at that point of time, Enron, General Electric, and Bechtel. And it was being financed by about 30 banks from around the world, including some of the most, um, some of the biggest financial institutions from India, including State Bank of India, ID, IDBI, um, ICICI Bank, uh, and others. As a young lawyer, I was sitting in a conference room and I heard this booming voice coming from a man who was dominating the meeting, had a dominating presence and a dominating voice. His name was Joe Sutton, who was one of the leaders within Enron. He was a former Marine from the US military. And he led deal teams like he, he led troops on the battlefield. And he was berating our clients about the fact that we were hesitating to lend to this marquee project one of the most high, high profile projects at that point of time in the world. The government of India had provided a guarantee, a controversial guarantee at that point of time in support of foreign investors and foreign lenders. It was designed to attract foreign investors, which India was struggling to attract at that point of time. The world has changed now, of course, for international investors are looking for ways in which they can increase their investments and exposure to India. But at that point of time, this government of India guarantee was controversial. And a number of lawsuits had been filed at that point of time, challenging the constitutional validity, statutory uh, validity of the government of India guarantee in favor of, private, of the private sector. And Joe Sutton was making the case in front of our clients that we were being silly, conservative, and downright um, unproductive in holding up the financing because of this lawsuit, this lawsuit without any merits in his view. And the entire room was silent, including some of the senior partners with 35 years of experience behind them were quiet. And I was a young lawyer with all of 12 months of experience at White and Case. And I looked around the table and said, what, nobody has anything to say about this? We can't stand up and say one thing about why we are holding up this financing. And I opened my mouth and I said, Mr. Sutton, we're holding this, this up for the following reasons. And I basically laid out all the reasons why this could be of concern. <laughs> and the room <laughs> went silent. And a few uh, minutes later, the meeting ended. I went back to my office and one of the senior partners walked into my office and he said, what you did there was stupid, but it was brave. Your arguments were valid, but not tactical. Uh, I hope you survive. If not, you are dead. If you survive, you are the best thing that happened to this firm. Fortunately, I survived. I lasted 27 years in the firm. I was probably not the best thing that happened to this firm. Again, what it illustrates is, you know, we all make mistakes. Sometimes mistakes pay off, sometimes they don't. You just need to be lucky. But what I want to point out there is, you know, I was immature at that point of time. We all are, we make mistakes. But we need to make calculated mistakes. 
you need to learn from your mistakes. In my case, that mistake was not fatal. Uh, but there was also some, you know, fundamental confidence, humbleness, technical competence in what I was saying. And to me, <clears throat> what I, I feel like it has carried me forward is that <clears throat> comfort in your own skin, confidence in your abilities, and projecting that humble confidence and believing in what, what you tr truly understand about yourself. You need to know first and foremost who you are and what you are capable of. Do not try to be who you are not. And learn from your experiences, right? So from that point onwards, I learned to be a bit more ta tactical, but I never gave up on expressing what I believed in. But I moderated what I said. Sometimes I went back and consulted with people what I was thinking, got the points of view from other people. Believed that just because you were right, it doesn't mean that it's the right time. To, you know, it's, you, you can blurt out what you feel at any point of time. There is a time and place for it. People have spent years thinking about issues, and you got to factor in all those points of view before, before you go out and blurt out your point of view. But if you are going to go and express your point of view, you have to have done your homework from all perspectives. And that has become even more challenging in this globalized world. You can't talk about it from one dimension or two dimensions. This world is multidimensional. And therefore, doing the homework is even harder. So what is important here is, again, I come back to the points, which is you, know, you got to find the mentors, the people who are coming to support you. And the person, the partner who walked into my room after this conversation became my lifelong mentor. Even now, when I'm faced with difficult issues, difficult decisions, I go, go back and call Larry Gannon who's now a retired partner and continues to provide advice. Now, people call me from time to time now that I've spent 27 years practice, practicing here in New York at White and & Case, and students come and ask me, what do I do? Do I go and do an LLM outside India? Uh, should I apply for a job at a law firm in India? Should I apply for an internship outside of India? What do I need to do? The question for me is, what do I tell these students? Uh, quite often, the specific advice I give you is less important than, than the perspective I provide. Because no advice can be given without knowing the context. When students come and ask me, what should I do? My, my response to them is, what do you want to do? Right? There is no way I can give an honest answer to that question without really understanding what you want to do. An advice that says you should go and do the following things is, is, is fundamentally what I would like to do, what I wished I had done. But it's not the same as what you wished you, would, you had done or what you would like to do. So what is more important is not what I have done or what I think I, you should do, but it's really about finding your passion. What is it that is really going to make you happy? Is it just a title? Is it just about being in a big law firm? Is it just money? Is it just about being somewhere physically? Is it just being in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Is it just about being in the United States or the UK or in Sonipat? What is it? What drives you? You got to think about this as a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, in times like this, when we're all apart and distant from one another, these core points really ultimately matter. It's not international practice or corporate practice that will carry you through. 
it is what you are interested in, what your passion drives you to do, right? So having that idea, the vision, knowing yourself, that's key. So when you come and ask for advice or go to Raj for advice or go to any advisor, any faculty member, go to them with an idea about what it is that you are looking to do, what it is that you are looking to get out of that. So provide them with your perspective of what it is that is going to, um, that is going to drive you. Give them the context so that you can actually get out of them the most that is, is going to be of help to you. Now, obviously, what you want to do will continue to change. And it has continued to change in my case over 27 years. As we speak here today, um, it's, it's very different from the way I used to think about my own career 20 years ago, very different from the way I used to think about it 10 years ago, very different from how I used to think about it 10 months ago. And that is another characteristic that is essential for all of us, which is to be nimble, uh, to be continue, to be continuing to innovate and reinvent yourself. The world is constantly changing. Uh, that is the only constant. At the same time, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Obvious contradictions here. Because what I come back to there is the more the world, world change, who you are fundamentally remains the same. The big, basic perspective you have gets adjusted, tinkered around, but you really need to know who you are fundamentally that'll help you carry you through. So that those every time go back to those fundamental principles. So I, I want to illustrate that by one more example, and that ties it back to the bar admissions and restrictions across different jurisdictions that, uh, that I talked about early on in my first um, anecdote. So I was representing, and again, putting it in the context that you can appreciate, I was representing a big infrastructure company from India, um, GMR infrastructure, which you may have heard of. It's a publicly traded company in India. They owned a multinational power company called Intergen that was based in Boston, which had assets in the UK, the Netherlands, Mexico, Philippines, Australia. It's a global power company. They were in the process of selling that company. And it, it was, we expected that it was, the deal was worth about 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollars. We were targeting global buyers. You know, when we were thinking about who are the likely buyers, we were thinking about buyers in China, buyers in Europe, buyers in the US, buyers in India. And the question was, when you are selling it, what is the appropriate governing law for the sale and purchase agreement for this? Because I'm an Indian company selling a US uh, managed company that has global operations. Should this be governed by Indian law? Should this be governed by New York law? Because I'm selling it to potentially Chinese buyers or European buyers, should it be governed by some other law in Asia or some other law in Europe? English law, for example. So one of the bidders for this asset was, in fact, Tata, Tata's, Tata Sons, Tata Power. And Tata Power was represented by another English law firm. I will not name them on this call. Uh, one of our competitors, very renowned law firm that was representing them. And we were conducting multiple sort of parallel negotiations with multiple bidders. We had a bidder who was a Chinese company. One of the bidders was a European bidder. Another bidder was Tata that was being represented by an English law firm. And a few, we had a few other, other bidders. And we decided to pick New York law as the governing law of the, of the sale and purchase agreement. And I was conducting negotiations with the English law firm representing the Indian client 
and arguing with me that because we were dealing with a company that had significant assets in the, U in, in, in the UK, we should have chosen English law instead of New York law. And this is the perspective of an English lawyer talking to a New York lawyer. Even though the clients were neither English nor New York, uh, nor, nor New Yorkers. My question was, why should we be choosing English law? Just because one asset happens to be a major asset, but one asset happens to be English law. Um, and we also, I also pointed out to him that we have a number of bidders and we cannot have a separate governing law for each document, uh, for each bidder. We have a common document and we're inviting every bidder to comment on the same document governed by the same set of laws. And along the conversation, it became very clear to both of us that this was a ridiculous, meaningless argument driven by the fact that we were all sitting in our own little cocoons, thinking about this from the perspective of either English law or New York law, without regard to really what the clients wanted. Neither GMR, nor the Tatas, nor the China Huanang group, which ultimately ended up winning this bid, nor any of the other European clients who were looking to buy for it, had any concern about the fact that this document is governed by New York law, nor would they have any concern that this was going to be if this had been governed by English law. But I had essentially, again, if I, with some modesty, speak about what really drove me at that point of time was the quiet confidence that I knew the strength of New York law. I knew what I was talking about. I knew what really mattered for the clients. I knew what really mattered for the bidders. And I could cut through all the artificial divisions between jurisdictions, not by engaging in unauthorized practice of law when I'm dealing with clients in different jurisdictions. And it's a very tricky issue that we face connected across various jurisdictions through the internet. You know, if I send an email advice to a client sitting in Europe, am I practicing European law? If I send advice to a client sitting in India, am I practicing Indian law? What does practice of law really mean in this cross-border context? I think it's not an issue question that can easily be dismissed but it is a very complex question. We all need to develop our own perspective on it. And my view about it is, look at what the clients want, look at what the bar regulations say, and figure out a way to navigate it. And this day and world, being qualified in more than one jurisdiction will help you and will take you a long way in navigating some of these issues. But it doesn't mean that just because you are admitted or qualified in one jurisdiction, you need to be held back in what you were able to do in this globalized and complicated world. You need to have an integrated holistic perspective on every issue, every matter, every dispute, every transaction that one is going to be dealing with. And it applies whether you are in a setting, an academic setting or a law firm setting or a courtroom setting. And it is that perspective of looking at problems holistically and with a view to finding an integrated solution to the problem that will ultimately uh, help you uh, navigate issues you face from time to time. So with that, um, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion um, and, you know, uh, I'm available to answer any questions you have. Now, I, 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 you know, I want to set aside enough time here to let you ask questions because the one thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, I would, I wished I had somebody who could have told me all these things when I was considering these options 27, 28 years ago, um, and there is never enough time uh, to. To provide, all, to, to provide all the advice that all of you are asking, but you know, I'm always happy to answer those questions. And sometimes 
while I am enthusiastic and always desirous of being in the midst of young, energetic, positive, um, inspiring community like this, uh, practicalities make it difficult. So I request forgiveness in advance if for some reason I'm not able to respond to an email or a phone call, but uh, always welcome uh, your um, goodwill, support, and friendship. Thank you very much, Raj. Thank you very much, Nandan, for a fascinating uh, commencement lecture because uh, the fact that you were addressing to law graduates who are pursuing master's degrees, some of them with experience, some of them with um, lived experiences, professional experiences, some of them with aspirations to pursue the kind of career that you have pursued, uh, it would have resonated with all of them, uh, your own life's journey, your struggles, your trials, your tribulations, your victories, your perspectives, all of which I'm sure was instructive to all of them. While we were going to give a few minutes for them to reflect on your talk and share some questions, I'm going to invite Professor Anand Prakash Mishra, who I missed inviting before, uh, in my excitement and enthusiasm to have you deliver the commencement lecture. Uh, I am going to request Professor Anand Prakash Mishra, who is the Director of Law School Admissions at OP Jindal Global University and Associate Dean of Jindal Global Law School, to introduce the LLM class of 2020. For all the students who are out there, please send in your questions, which we will take up very shortly after Professor Mishra's uh, short presentation. Anand, over to you. Very good evening, all of you. It's indeed a great moment for all of us at Jindal Global Law School and at OP Jindal Global University to have all the students of LLM residential program, which has been like our flagship postgraduate law program at OP Jindal Global University since 2010. So in 2020, when I invite all those 156 students of LLM program, I'm extremely delighted. And uh, what a class it is. I have great pleasure and honor to introduce this class to our chief guest of the day, Mr. Nandan Nelivigi, who is himself uh, uh, an institution in himself, the way he has uh, taken his own career and now as a partner in one of the world's largest law firm, White & Case. And such an inspiring speech for the young people who have chosen the Masters of Law program at Jindal Global Law School. So it's a great occasion. It's a great time. And I must tell all the law graduates uh, who have taken this uh, bold step, I will say, in these times of COVID to pursue their higher education to pursue their master's degree in law uh, at JGLS. I congratulate all of you for joining us. And uh, my delight is actually more when I look at the profiles of the students who have joined uh, from across the country. Few things have happened for the first time, like our class is more than 100 students class in LLM. I remember our Vice Chancellor, Professor C. Rajkumar, and the Dean of Law School used to uh, tell me in uh, previous years that Anand, when I went to Harvard Law School, it was a class of 180 students uh, from different uh, countries around the world. I tell him today that we have a class of 155 students from 22 different states, representing over 50 different law schools and universities all over the country. And I'm very sure in future we'll be getting students uh, graduating from uh, other parts of the world also to our campus. So another unique development, I will say, for the first time our LLM class has more girls as students, more female candidates than male candidates in significant numbers. So in our class of 156, 89 candidates, 60% of the class is a uh, woman candidate. And 40% of the class is male candidates, which happened for the first time. Earlier, it was either equal or the number of male candidates were higher. So I must congratulate all the girls who have joined us from around the country. Uh, 
five universities I could find where more than 10 students have joined us in our LM class. Of course, some of those universities are affiliating nature of universities and uh, there are multiple law colleges, but the Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University, University of Mumbai, uh, the Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University is a state university in Delhi with multiple affiliated colleges, University of Mumbai, OP Jindal Global University, Pune University, and Symbiosis International University, where more than 10 students have joined our law school in the LM program. There are another eight law schools where more than five students have joined us. This MET Law School, Noida, Vivekananda Law School, Guru Gobind Singh IP University, Delhi, Jindal Global Law School, Symbiosis Law School, Pune, Keat Law School, Bhubaneswar, Kerala Law Academy Law College, Kashmir University, there are four students who have joined us from University of Kashmir. It's very, very, uh, I mean, uh, I'm actually very delighted uh, that we could not uh, uh, travel to Kashmir for a long time, but the students are aspiring to come to Sonipat and study law. Uh, I'm extremely uh, happy to welcome them. And uh, unfortunately due to COVID situation, we are not uh, able to have them now but I'm very sure they will be joining us soon the moment uh, government restrictions are removed. As students from School of Excellence in Law in Chennai, VIT Law School in Chennai, UPS Dehradun, MS University Baroda, Rizvi Law College Mumbai, NLU Odisha, HNLU Raipur, DSNLU Vizag, and New Law College Pune, all these places, more than say three to five students have joined us. But then there are students from 50 different law colleges. If I name them, my time will be up. But uh, certainly I'm ex actually delighted to name few of those law schools like Andhra University, Visaka Patna, Auro University in Surat, Banastali Vidya Peet in Rajasthan, Bharti Vidya Peet University in Pune, Bundelkhand University uh, in uh, Jhansi, uh, Calcutta University, uh, Devi Ahilya Vishwiddala Indor, GD Goenka University, Haryana, Goa University, Gorakhpur University, Gujarat University, GNDU Amritsar, Ikfai University in Dehradun, Jamia Milia Islamia, University of Delhi, Kit University in Bhubaneswar, Kashmir University, Kerala University, MS University Baroda, MD University Rotak, Modi University in Rajasthan, Nirma University in Ahmedabad, RSTM Nagpur University, and then uh, the Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, Tamil Nadu uh, Dr. Ambedkar Law University. There are students from around the country who have joined us. And it's a matter of extreme delight for me to welcome each one of you to this campus. Uh, I will take another two minutes sharing more facts, but before that, I must express my uh, sincere gratitude to the University Grants Commission, which made one year LM program possible in India. In January 2013, for the first time in India, one year LM program was started. And it was the Ministry of HRD, which set up the round table on legal education in 2012 to make legal education reforms and the expert committee which submitted its report and UGC issued the guidelines in January 2013, which paved the way for one year LM program. When I did my LM many years back, it was either a two year or a three year LM program. Today, our students are undergoing a rigorous one year LM program like any other country in the world, like the US where Nandan or Professor Rajkumar studied in Harvard Law School or like students study in Singapore or UK or Australia or any other part of the world. So that 2013, I will actually encourage all the students who are attending this uh, session to go through those guidelines of UGC and acquaint yourself how it was a major reform in postgraduate legal education in our country uh, in this century, which, which never happened in past. Uh, 24 credits full-time program uh, where a dedicated center for postgraduate legal studies was to be created. 
And today I'm really delighted to have Professor Sridhar Patnaik with us, who was our founding director of Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, and now the registrar of the university, as well as our new director of CPGLS, Professor Vishwas Devaya, and our executive dean, uh, Professor Srijit, who all have been contributed a lot uh, in uh, building this one-year LM program in a big way. So uh, I, I, I think we should, uh, uh, it's, it's a great occasion and thank you all the students for joining us. You come from different parts of the country, but I tell you, you all graduate as the LLM candidates of OP Jindal Global University of Jindal Global Law School in 2021. So all the very best and uh, uh, welcome to GGLS, welcome to Sonipat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand, for that uh, really uh, comprehensive tour de force. Uh, Vishwas tells me that there are undergrad students from uh, Nalsar, NLSU, GNLU, NUJS, NULUJ, CNLU, and other um, yes. graduates from some of the leading law schools who have also joined uh, Jindal Global Law School LLM program. So I'm very happy to hear that as well. All right, let me move to the Q&A session. Um, so, uh, Nandan, there are a number of questions, but let me start with what challenges does a global lawyer face in navigating cross-border mergers and acquisitions? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, um, Raj, do you mind just repeating the question again? Sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, the question is, what challenges does a global lawyer face in particularly navigating cross-border M&A transactions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, ch the challenges start from multiple time zones to multiple legal specialties that one needs to uh, really um, bring together in order to get the deal done. And I think, again, the perspective matters. Um, a cross-border M&A lawyer, you, need, you can think about the lawyer in multiple ways. I think about the cross-border M&A transactions and my role in those transactions as somebody who's actually overseeing the entire transaction, regardless of the jurisdiction, as I mentioned in the example that I was giving earlier, and the challenges include, again, navigating, figuring out where are the assets? What kind of diligence needs to be done on those assets? Do we have the right experts to advise you on those assets? And even within those assets, you may actually identify, even within those jurisdictions, you may identify a law firm which you think has the relevant expertise but may not necessarily have the expertise in each of the areas where you need specific advice. So you may have a corporate law firm in, in London that is available to help you on English law, but may not necessarily have the expertise on intellectual property issues. So you need to dig into that. So first and foremost, the biggest challenge is assembling the right team of experts, even though you yourself are an expert in order for you to be viewed as a trusted advisor to your client, you need to understand what your own limitations are, what kind of teams you need to put together, and you need to make a recommendation to your clients for that purpose. And then the issues relate to uh, harmonizing or reconciling conflicting practices from different jurisdictions. In the example that I gave earlier, English lawyers will come at it from their own perspective. Asian lawyers and Asian clients will come at it come at the transaction from their own perspective and American lawyers and clients will come at it from their own perspective and the challenges of harmonizing those practices. And finally, of course, the laws. You know, if, for example, your client is buying a company in Europe that has subsidiaries in India, in Philippines, in Mexico, in Brazil, you are going to have a knock-on effect you are going to have consequences in each of those jurisdictions. You may need to seek antitrust approvals in those jurisdictions. 
You may need to comply with public company takeover regulations in those jurisdictions because by taking control or ownership of the company in the in Europe, you may actually be taking control of a publicly publicly traded company in India, for example. It may trigger mandatory tender offer requirements under the Indian Takeover Code, even though you were not actually taking ownership of the direct stock in the Indian entity. Um, and so though the, the, the challenge is one of actually looking ahead. It's not about thinking about the one issue that is presented to you here and now, but thinking about all the issues that could come up over the course and the life of the transaction and being prepared to address them right up front. Um, and navigating through really multiple specialties and multiple jurisdictions. Hope that answers. Happy to uh, address any specific queries. Thank you, Nandan, for that. Um, uh, there are uh, a few questions which are very interesting about the nature of the transnational legal practice. One question is that, how does one even deal with uh, jurisdictions from developing world, given that laws and courts function in a completely different way? And how does a, a sort of a transnational corporate lawyer address that? Um, again, it's, it, it comes back to, um, first of all, you know, in a large law firm like ours, we build together the relevant database of information that we need about most of the jurisdictions that we frequently encounter in our practice. So first and foremost, the infrastructure that one has is going to be critical which is why having the resources of a law firm are critical for being able to properly service the needs of the clients in large multi-jurisdictional matters like this. In fact, that's the reason why it becomes very hard for not only small law firms, uh, but also for small companies, which may have operations overseas to navigate the issues that they face in those jurisdictions. The tax issues are complicated. Employment issues are complicated. Intellectual property issues are complicated. They're not the same as in any one jurisdiction. And you don't find one advisor who can advise you on all the jurisdictions. And it very quickly becomes very expensive. And so even for clients, the advice that I provide is, you know, before you think about the opportunities to expand globally, you really have to think about how you are going to manage the issues. It's the same issue that we face, for example, suddenly, you know, we have an apartment, let's say you buy an apartment in Delhi, it's very easy to manage the apartment in a condo. The next thing you know, you go and buy a 20 acre farm in Himachal Pradesh. The issues that you face in managing a farm in Himachal Pradesh from a long distance are much more complicated. It's the same thing with an international transaction. And so, it takes certain level of scale in order to be able to do that. The second thing in terms of the infrastructure and the resources we put together is we do assemble talent, lawyers, students from multiple jurisdictions within our firm. We have offices in various countries around the world. We have interns from different countries who come and work with us. Um, and we have seasoned lawyers in our firm who are qualified in multiple jurisdictions. So the fundamental point here is that no one person can do it all by him, himself or herself. It takes, it takes a team and you need to take a team approach and figure out how you are going to solve the problems together and how you are going to put together all the pieces of the puzzle um, to meet the needs of a given compl you know, complex deal than trying to accomplish it all by yourself. Thank you very much, Nandan. Uh, Nandan, one of the things, uh, this is a more personal question probably for a number of LLM students. Uh, these are students who have obviously come from different law schools. Uh, they have completed their undergrad degree. Uh, and while LLM could be an aspiration for some people to pursue uh, academic career, but a large number of students are not joining the LLM program with that intention. What would you like to tell them when it comes to 
let's say, their own broad, uh, you know, aspirations to do several things within the legal profession and how can they make the best use of that LLM opportunity to advance their legal careers. Yeah, thank you, Raj. A couple of points on that. One is, you know, keep the options open. Have a broad approach to a lot of different areas of interest. But at the same time, have your focus on a couple of things, right? So it's a constant balancing act between um, general competence and specialization. You need both. You cannot be a one trick pony, but at the same time, you cannot also be a jack of all trades and master of none. You need all of those, right? You need your strength, but you also need a basic level competence and understanding with respect to a broad set of areas that continue to um, play a part as you grow. That's, that's one, keep that in mind, think about that. And it's not an easy point to really grasp, but it's important. Secondly, the point I made earlier, which is that it's not necessarily the physical environment you live in that is going to help you, but it is the, the ecosystem made up of individuals. It's you, your fellow students, the faculty members, and the people you interact with from time to time. And constantly look for perspectives, mentorship, and experiences. The more you do, the more you learn. There is no amount of textbook reading for a swimmer that's going to teach a, teach a swimmer how to swim until you jump into the water. It's the same thing. Look for those live experiences. Grab the opportunities, put yourself in the middle of the action and do it. Get your hands dirty and do it and learn from your mistakes. And by the way, on the mistakes, I, I talked about my mistakes and, 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 and I, I sorry to go back to the generalities, but the point here is be prepared to make mistakes, be prepared to apologize, be prepared to say sorry, but go in with full preparation. Mistakes, technical mistakes can always be fixed, but what cannot be fixed are mistakes of integrity, mistakes of attitude, have the right attitude, right? Be humble, be prepared to learn, if you make mistakes with respect to attitude of integrity, cheating, treating somebody badly, lying, those are hard to fix. But mistakes that you make while you are learning about technical aspects, they can always be fixed. So be prepared to make those mistakes. Thank you so much, Nandan. Uh, there's one more very interesting question about the fact that uh, um, you know, how much of uh, balance between theory and practice that a typical LLM student should, uh, you know, bring into their own learning? Because, you know, uh, one of the things that in the legal profession people talk about is that you need to have a more practical, uh, you know, uh, orientation. And of course, law schools are known to be focusing a lot more on theory. And how does one actually find a balance from the standpoint of a, a serious master's student? Very good question, Raj. Again, this is always a constant balancing act, but you need both. You know, a practice without theory is going to fall apart very quickly. If you don't have the fundamental foundation to know um, that what you are doing in practice is right, sooner or later, um, you will get exposed. At the same time, you know, focusing purely on theory without an understanding about how it is going to impact the clients in practice or people in daily lives is also not going to be all that useful. Um, what I would say is there is again a time and place for everything. Um, in law school, I, I think my, my focus was really on making sure that my theoretical foundations the theoretical underpinnings, my understanding about the basic principles were solid. I can't tell you the number of times that I keep uh, 
coming back to first principles, basic principles of contract law. All these words that we sp speak about, about cross-border, multi-jurisdictional, interdisciplinary practices, those are all big words. But if fundamentally, if you do not understand the basic principles of contract, uh, basic principles of corporate law, and none of that is going to matter. It all boils down to simple, simple legal principles that we all learn in law school and build upon that. And then, you know, you have to build upon that. You can't stop at that. You have to figure out how you continue to strengthen and learn about additional complications and layers and, and continue to do sophisticated analysis. But I think, you know, focusing on, for example, academic writing, publication, will strengthen your research skills, will strengthen your writing skills, will strengthen your presentation skills. Fundamental skills that will stand in good stead no matter which world you live in. Um, and and it'll, it'll ultimately help you succeed, whether you pursue an academic career or research career or a or a or practice. Um, thank you so much, Vishwas. Maybe we'll take one last question. This question is about the fact that uh, um, you know, since we have you know at, at Jindal, we have uh, the general LLM program. We also have LLM in corporate and financial law, LLM in trade and investment law, LLM in IP, taxation, different branches. So um, after having gone through this particular one of the specialized LLM programs, um, you know, if a person wants to decide to move into another branch of practice of law, uh, would that be okay? Is that something that uh, they should feel terrible about? And if they do need to make those tough choices, how can they, how should they go about? Short answer, absolutely okay. The talking about choices, Raj, you know, I think, first of all, I want to tell you uh, t tell all the students and their family members here first of all they are working with one of the best institutions in the world they are they are benefiting from the best resources they can get anywhere in the world now that they are part of the jindal community and the problem they're going to face is a problem of choice they have plenty of choices here and you know, I, I honestly believe that the Jindal community provides some of the best resources, the best options that one could find anywhere in the world and make use of them. Don't hesitate to pick a topic of your interest. You want to dive into it deeper, go for it. Uh, this is a marathon. I keep saying this is not a sprint. And if at the end of the process, you don't like it, it's never too late, switch it. What you specialized, focused on will always be of help. It is easier to start from a somewhat broader topic for specialization initially that gives you the ability to, um, to switch in the future. Um, as I said, keep the options open. Uh, don't be too narrow initially have a broader area of specialization, and you can always pick a topic for a given month, given quarter, given semester, given year. But remember that it's going to be constantly changing and be prepared to pivot, be nimble, and shift constantly. But this is a luxury that you have so many options and choices here. Well, thank you very much, London. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic to hear you. We can continue this conversation for long. But all the students here, I must say that we have a, a fascinating program at Columbia Law School. Uh, every year, uh, nearly 35 of our students go to Columbia for a program uh, that specifically focused on US business law. And uh, LLM students are indeed eligible to go for that. And uh, it is always also an established convention that whenever we do that program, uh, Nandan and White and Case and his uh, um, managing part, chairman of the firm, uh, Hugh Guerriott, uh, host a talk and a dinner at the White and Case office in New York. Uh, it's a very grand uh, function that Nandan hosts. And so I look forward to seeing some of you 
uh, take the program. We also have a partnership with the Wharton School. Uh, uh, again, something that's open to LLM students. Besides our partnership with uh, uh, with Harvard and with Oxford and Fletcher and Berkeley. So, um, as Nandan mentioned, uh, one of the things that we didn't have when we went to law school uh, in India, and I dare say we didn't even have, at least I didn't have the kind of experiences even when I went abroad for the kind of opportunities that we are giving to students at Jindal. So I sincerely hope you will make the best use of it. Uh, in my own closing, I would say that uh, people like Nandan Nelivigi are hugely inspiring figures uh, for many a generation of law students, not only because of all the accomplishments that he has had, but all the values that he has stood for, including the things that he spoke about today, uh, humility, uh, gracefulness, uh, gratitude, uh, and also an attitude in which uh, wherever, wherever there are challenges to be able to overcome with a deep sense of grit and determination. Uh, what Nandan didn't tell you is that uh, he was, uh, he was uh, recruited in White and Case at a time when it was quite rare for lawyers who have studied in international jurisdictions, including countries like India, to be able to recruit it in an international uh, you know, law firm such as White and Case. Uh, he remains part of that generation where that was a very rare phenomenon. Although the last decade has seen a lot more people doing that, and even Nandan's firm, since we have a collaboration with uh, White and Case, Nandan has also enabled uh, several of our own uh, graduates to initially go through a summer program, and some of them have been recruited in their London and even New York offices of White and Case. So all this is possible for you. I think uh, uh, we've had an inspiring commencement speaker in Nandan. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you uh, and appreciate your presence. We are coming to the end of the program. I want to quickly invite Professor Vishwas Devaya, the Director of the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies and Vice Dean of Jindal Global Law School uh, to introduce the CPGLS uh, um, and also about the LLM class itself. Vishwas, over to you. Sorry, um, Raj, I, I do need to drop off in two minutes. And if that's OK, no problem, uh, you sh we should feel free to continue. And I will disconnect at, uh, in two minutes. Yes, Nandan, we understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to um, congratulate all the students um, for this adventure, on this adventure, and wish them all the best. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Sorry, Vishwas, please go ahead. Thank you, Raj, and thank you, Nandan, for that inspiring speech that made their day. They've had a long day today. I mean, it started at nine in the morning, so it's been uh, literally 11 hours. So, you know, thumbs up to them. And uh, let me kind of introduce uh, Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies for the uninitiated CPGLS or Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies is established to offer advanced and interdisciplinary teaching, learning and research opportunities in law for postgraduate students at the master's level. We are committed to provide an intellectually stimulating academic environment with highly qualified, experienced, and dedicated faculty members committed to provide an excellent and world-class legal education. The postgraduate programs incorporate both transactional and comparative approaches to learning and research, try to maintain a balance between theory and practice. And uh, it's, it's a proud occasion to kind of mention here that CPGLS has so far managed to graduate 370 students. Some of our students have gone on to actually, some of our students have gone on to actually, uh, you know, work in some well-established uh, law firms in India. They've gone on to work in uh, companies like Mahindra, uh, you know, Kias, Kias, and a number of other well-known, uh, you know, IP-based law firms as well. And uh, it's also a proud moment for someone who's also been uh, a teacher in a national law school like NUDS. I've taught in NUDS for two and a half years. It's almost interesting to kind of come back and meet your own students from, from law schools, from NUJS. In fact, I have a student of mine who I taught while I was teaching in NUJS who has joined us to pursue 
her LLM degree in environmental law. So it's a fairly proud moment for most of us as you know, it, it, it reflects in terms of how our law school has pretty much kind of gone on and set a benchmark for legal education in South Asia. And a lot of young aspiring law students intend to pursue their you know, law degrees, you know, master's degree from, from, from Jindal Global Law School largely kind of you kind of uh, you know see a trend out here that it almost is acting as a substitute for a number of foreign you know law schools in that way so i hope uh, that we can keep our flag flying high and uh, i'll also kind of use this occasion to uh, make a very interesting announcement that our new batch of llm students have actually conceived a new set of uh, initiatives to kind of carry forward a dialogue series in the coming two semesters. Uh, the students of, uh, of, of the corporate law and corporate and financial law have actually kind of created their own student body to kind of have a dialogue series of uh, involving corporate and financial law practitioners. Uh, we will be kind of also initiating uh, a few more dialogue series on IP and technology, on uh, trade and investment law, and a new initiative, which is largely going to be talking about role of women in law, which is going to be a new dialogue series where our own law students are going to spearhead, our own postgraduate law students are going to spearhead this dialogue series. They will invite the speakers we as faculty members are going to just mentor them. So this is uh, a new initiative started from our own new batch of LLM students. And uh, with that, we can pretty much say that uh, the future is bright. There's a lot of uh, leadership ability amongst them. And uh, we look forward to an engaging uh, year with our LLM students. Thanks a lot. All right, uh, we are coming to the end of the program. Now I invite uh, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, the Registrar of OP Jindal Global University to deliver his um, concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, well, all I can say is that uh, an enchanting and a fascinating uh, lecture by uh, Nandan. And uh, just two very quick points. Uh, what you mentioned is like a pathway as to what a master's student is not supposed to do. One thing which is very important is to develop a sense of purpose and perspective, along with credibility, integrity, and professional image. And to all the students uh, who joined the LLM program uh, this year at the Jinder Global Law School, uh, all I'm going to say is that this is what you can expect uh, at the JGU. And uh, everything that uh, the commencement speaker has so very uh, eloquently articulated is what you're going to experience when you begin your classes. Uh, today is day one, but as you uh, go further into your coursework and uh, the uh, remainder of the semester, uh, you'll get to know all these things through various of your core courses and even the uh, electives uh, that you had chosen. Uh, but the message is very loud and clear Specializations are indeed very important, uh, but let me also uh, borrow an interesting phrase uh, often used by a celebrated professor of law and development, uh, David Trubeck, uh, who says that uh, law is a socio-legal project and uh, in an era of globalization, uh, sophistication in corporate law uh, also requires knowledge and understanding of sociology and even public law areas. And that kind of a sophistication is what is required. And I can assure you that all of this is going to be offered to you, but you need to take up responsibility for your work to make the right choices. And you will have guidance in abundance at the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, in the Gender Global Law School, and the entire university. So please make the best out of the next one year that you have. And rest assured, you'll have a wonderful career ahead in terms of whatever you choose to do. And on this particular note, 
I would like to thank the commencement speaker and even the vice chancellor for all the leadership guidance and support and the leadership of the law school uh, at JGU and the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies at the JGU and all the relevant offices uh, who uh, developed this program and uh, uh, curated this uh, wonderful evening for us. Uh, so on this particular note, I close, uh, but nonetheless, your intellectual journey continues. So I wish all the very best to each one of you. Thank you so much. And the program has ended. Thank you, and Anand and Srijit and Vishwas. Uh, Sridhar, thanks.